Uh, but as we come to our time of prayer this morning, I have a challenge for you, for some of you to take. If you, as you leave this morning, out there on the little counter, there are 14 uh, journals, and they are labeled 100 Days to Cultivating Kindness. And what they have is they have a little daily devotional reading and then blank space for you to write not your name, but rather the things that are you're kind of challenged to think about and to pray through on there. And I want to challenge you to take one. Now you say, wait a minute, there's only 14. There's more than 14 of us. Well, the first step is to cultivate kindness by not getting in a fight over a journal. Uh, but the, the second is this. Not everybody is going to want to do that. And I didn't want to buy a hundred of them because then I would have had to move a hundred of them from down there to up here. And, you know, when you get a hundred books, they're heavy. Um, so anyway, so th there's 14 of them. So I would encourage you to, to do this. First of all, don't say, well, I'm not going to take the first one because I, I, I want to make sure that everybody else gets one. Go ahead and take one um, and go ahead and take the last one and all the ones in between. Uh, but if you really want to participate in the challenge to do this, and there's not one out there, I need you to let me know, and we'll order more. And your 100 days can just start a few days after somebody else. Okay? Uh, but I want to encourage you to, to do that and to work on seeing, work through that, and as you do that, seeing the world around you in a new light. And that connects to our prayer for Mount Olive Baptist Church this morning. And it's this. It's very easy for us as a church to see the world in a dark and foreboding light and to see us as just kind of stuck here toiling on and toiling on and to see those who come in the door as maybe hopefully somebody that'll come and do stuff, somebody that'll come and, you know, somebody that'll come and tithe, somebody that'll come and show up, somebody that'll come and, and, and do this, that, or the other, and rather than seeing them with kindness. Romans talks about that the kindness of the Lord is intended to lead us to repentance, and our kindness should reflect God's kindness, which is, is graceful and merciful. And so I would encourage you, this morning, even if you're not, even if you're thinking, I don't have time to journal, I don't want to journal, I, that's fine. You don't have to. I'm not, I'm going to tell you what to do in the sermon. I'm not telling you what to do right now. I'm just asking some of you to pick it up and do it. Uh, but if you want to, if you want to participate in that, I want to encourage you in that. But I do want you to pray that we as a church will be a church that, be, that reflects God's kindness to the world around us. One of our big challenges as a church is that we're really good at reflecting God's kindness to us. Uh, you know, there's not a person in this room that feels like there's not people in this church that are kind to them, which is good. But what we need to to, to do what our need is is to make sure that there are people that people outside this church know us as a kind group of people that does not exclude from us holding to the truth but it, it, it does it does mean that we need to cultivate and grow that kindness and so I want to encourage you to do that and I want us to pray that we would be that kind of people uh, this morning. You know, we, we think about it, you know, Jesus is the kind of person that people came to. Kids flocked to Jesus. People in need flocked to Jesus. Even grumpy, angry, religious people flocked to Jesus. Anyway. Well, let, let, let's pray that we have that same spirit and mindset. So let's go to the Lord in prayer for a few moments and I'll lead us in the Lord's prayer which will be there on the screens behind me. Let's pray.
Will you join me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis, first book in your Bible. Once you get past the book of table of contents, which is not truly inspired. Um, if it has a mistake in it, and it, it might, you need the Bible company needs to talk to their editor. But uh, the Genesis, the first book in your Bible, it's one of... It's the first of, as God tells, his, tells the story of what's going on and what he is doing in the world, we get Genesis as the book of beginnings. It's part of the first five books of the Bible or a grouping that we call the Torah. Um, that's, that's the uh, Hebraic name for them, or we'll call them also the Pentateuch, which means five books. Um, you know, so, you know, real creative naming there. You know, but, uh, but anyway, so that's, that's where Genesis is. Uh, we think that Genesis, for the most part, is written down in its final form by Moses. Maybe a little bit of editing uh, in the days a little bit after Moses. We also think that it's made from records as well as being you know, records that, that Moses, under the inspiration of the Spirit, is called to put together. And where we are in the overall flow of the story is this, we've come out from the flood, we spent a little time on the flood, we've come out of the flood, and God has put people into the earth that has been uh, judged by the flooding of the, whole, of, of the whole earth, and everything's been wiped out, um, lots of fish left over, um, but very few in terms of animals and plants that's all starting to come back and to grow back, and God has given people the command to go out and fill the earth and multiply. Um, he's given them the command also to highlight it that, you know, that human life is supposed to be valued, that you're not supposed to take another person's life. And he actually establishes you know, a, a very severe penalty in terms of the, the death penalty uh, for bringing death on another human being. Genesis chapter 10 gives us the story, gives us kind of the details about how as humanity spread out, they started scattering around. Um, and if you've got a study Bible, you either have a map down there in your footnotes, or you've got one in the back that kind of shows where all those family groups moved to as they spread out. And then from there, they spread out farther and farther. And we could spend several days on, the, uh, on how all that traces out and all of the genetics and all of the the historical studies that actually underline how this really does seem to be reflected. You know, this is not a portion of the Bible that we should have any kinds of doubts about uh, in terms of that it happened, because we can actually trace it not only through what we see here in Scripture, but you can pick up and trace uh, a history of the, the development of what goes on in the world, and you can find it there. You, know, you can find that these things untrack and that these things happen. And as they've spread out, there is a group of them who have moved eastward. And we'll pick up their story in Genesis 11. The whole earth had a common language and a common vocabulary. When the people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick instead of stone and tar instead of mortar. Then they said, Come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered across the face of the entire earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people had started building. And the Lord said, If as one people all sharing a common language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be beyond them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so they won't be able to understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there across the face of the entire earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the entire world. And from there, the Lord scattered them across the face of the entire earth. So what's going on here? Well, this is a fairly famous portion of, of Scripture. 
After all, if you listen to the radio, you'll start hearing ads for, um, you'll hear it on, uh, you know, on our local radio stations for an app you can put on your phone to learn foreign languages, and the name of the app is Babbel. Uh, you know, it's, it's an app that you can get a subscription to, you can learn how to, you know, you, you can learn that. You see it showed up even in the early days of the internet based off of a, of a book of a translation program, and it was actually called Babel Fish to begin with, um, and then it's kind of tracked back down to, to Babel, and it shows up. This, this sinks in, and, and again, this is something that we can actually spot historically, that, that languages spread out, and the more people spread out, the more the language is going to become more and more confused, and the more it's going to become different. Now, to hit a couple of important notes, First of all, we do not know what language they spoke before this happened. You know, when it talks about that they had a common language, there is no evidence, there's nothing scriptural that tells us everybody at the time was actually speaking this language. Some people say, oh, everybody spoke Hebrew at the beginning. There's nothing in the Bible that supports that idea. Uh, and actually for that, we should be eternally grateful. Hebrew is a pain in the neck to learn. Uh, you know, English is far, far easier, and it goes the right direction. Hebrew goes from right to left. Also, there are no vowels in Hebrew, um, which means that I, you wouldn't know whether to call me Dig or Doug. So you, you really, you don't, you, know, you need, you, you know, languages are, are funny things like that. Uh, so we don't know. In fact, I would suggest to you that uh, when the Lord confused and confounded their language, he didn't leave the original one behind at all. Uh, because otherwise you would develop an arrogance of, well, at least we still talk normal and the rest of y'all people don't talk right. Uh, now, we know that that is true, that everybody else don't talk right and we talk right in, our, in, 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 in the South, okay? Uh, you know, all the rest of y'all, any of y'all don't talk like us. But, so we don't know that. We don't know what they, how they spoke, and maybe they did all speak a language that still survives, but it does, there's nothing to support that. It's certainly not something you'd want to stake a claim on or have extended arguments about. It's really just not worth it. Uh, but we do see that they did, that they, that they spoke, they were working together uh, to do this. Now, a couple of other notes that should be made are this. First of all, Shinar is in the area that we would now call Iraq. At the time, it would have been called Babylon. Uh, in the time of the people of Israel when they're first receiving this. So there is a connection between calling, calling the Tower Babel, between calling the, the place Babylon. Yeah, that's, where, that's what's going on. Now, there's also no definite biblical indication as to which group of people this is, where this fits in the genealogies, who's actually in charge of it. We have various stories and ideas that have come down to us. Well, what we just have in the text is this simple statement. They had a common language, and they decided that, hey, we're going to build a tower to make a name for ourselves. And so we need to talk about that and what's going on here. First of all, we should realize that probably not everybody got together and took a vote on this. Most likely what's gone on here is that a few people who were stronger than the rest, maybe they were better warriors, maybe they were just more organized, Maybe they were just those naturally charismatic people like worship leaders that draw people in and they get folks to do what they want them to do and said, hey, let's, let's do this. And they lay out a plan and we're going to do this. Now, the language that is used here to describe how the instructions are given is actually the same words, the same discussion that Pharaoh has about the children of Israel in Egypt coming up in Exodus in about 50 chapters. Now, for us, when we read it, we think, well, that's really far apart. There's like a thousand years between these two things. But realize, who wrote, who wrote Genesis? Who wrote Exodus? How far apart did he write Genesis and Exodus? Not very. Okay, how far apart did the people of Israel first read Genesis and Exodus? Not very far apart. They would have heard these things at the same time. In fact, when they read Genesis, they'd have been thinking, we just lived through baked bricks. Why highlight the, the fact that they had, that, that the people building at Babel have brick instead of stone and tar instead of mortar? 
except to highlight the difference in how the towers being built on Shinar versus what Pharaoh had had the people of Israel doing when they were in oppression and bondage in Egypt. Because realize that the people who first read Genesis don't have to read Exodus to know what's going on. They were there. They know. They've heard. Let's have, the, let's have somebody make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Because that's what their overseers have come in with the lash and the whip and the chains and said, hey, get over there and make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Most likely what you have here is that a group of people have established themselves as rulers over others and said, by the way, here's your task. I want, we want you to build a tower. Why do we want a tower? We want a tower and we want a city so that we're not scattered, so that we can be important, so that we can make a name for ourselves. And when you see make a name for yourself here in Scripture, when this is being talked about fame and, and, and glory, fortune goes with it. That's the idea. Fame and fortune and glory is what they're after. We want to build this tower. We want to build this city. Because when we build this tower and we build this city, we will draw in people. People will come through us. Then they will pay us and we will make ourselves wealthy. Because the tower that they're building, we, we're pretty sure that it looks like a typical fertile crescent ziggurat, which looks like a pyramid. Looks the same as the pyramids that the Mayans build in South America, and we can talk about that Wednesday night. We probably will. Uh, but they, they're building this pyramid, they're building this ziggurat. And the purpose of building these that we find that they've written down when they've left, re left behind records in Babylon and in other places is these were places where the gods could come down and interact with the people around them. They're not building a tower so they can go up to heaven. They're building a tower so that God will come down from heaven, so that one of the gods will come down from heaven, and that way, when that God comes down, they can then charge people to worship. That's how they're going to make a name for themselves. That's how they're going to strengthen their city. What they're doing is striving to build a tower to make themselves important and make God work for them. That's what they're after. And the Lord God looks down and says, you know what? They're going to build a tower. They want me to come down. I will come down. However, one should keep in mind that when the Lord God Almighty comes down, he comes down in his own good time and his own good way. And it may be that when he comes down, he does not come down to be subservient to people. But instead, he comes down to remind us that he is Lord of all. And in fact, that's what happens here. He sees the tower, not that he wasn't aware of it, and that don't ever read the, uh, well, let me go down, the Lord came down to see. <laughs> not that he couldn't see it. This is just a picture of a visitation of the presence of God. We recognize that God is always present everywhere. There's no place that you can go that God is not. You cannot hide from Him. We see this in the psalmist when the psalmist worships and talks about, if I, you know, if I make my, my bed in the grave, you're there. If I go to the highest of heights, you are there. There's no 12-mile limit where you can get outside of God's territory and say, oh, no, I'm too high up. I'm too far, too far to the east, too far to the west, too far down. You are always someplace that the presence of God is. This is actually a mistake that we make at times when we discuss the idea of hell and eternal judgment and that we try to make it out as the place that God is not, and it's not. It's a place that the, that the, that the dominant presence of God is the presence of His wrath. If it were a place that God is not, those who reject God all their life and decide that they'd like to, you know, decide that they want to reject God, get exactly what they want in eternity. How does that work? 
Nowhere in Scripture do we find that idea supported, that there is a place in creation that God says, I'm not going to go there. And hell is not the presence of the rule of Satan. It is the presence of the overwhelming wrath of God. But let's also not miss that there are times that God is more evidently present than normal. This is what some of those moments that many, uh, that, that many of us have seen in our lives that we might look back and say, well, this was revival or this is when God spoke to me or this is when there was this special closeness that we had. This was a place that was good. This was a time that was amazing. That's what we see here is that the Lord God comes down to visit. Now, I would challenge you to think about this as a church. There are times that we pray, Lord, if you would come down and visit us today. And if we pray that in humility and in trust, it's not a bad prayer. But we should be very careful that it's not a prayer of arrogance, that it's not a prayer of demand, that it's not a prayer of insistence, or a prayer that we want God to come down so that we can tell him what to do as the builders at Babel did. But rather a prayer that God would come down that we would hear him speak plainly, which is my prayer every time we are gathered as a church. even in such things that we might think are mundane, like a business meeting or a committee meeting, that the Lord would come down, that we would hear him. As the prophet prays, that he would rend the heavens and come down. As the Lord comes down and sees, sees what they are desiring, and says, no, I will not have this. I will not have people build a tower and a city and think that they can gather and tell me what to do, think that they can avoid my judgment and my justice because they've built something fancy. I will not have them break the backs of their neighbors that they can build it stronger and taller and better. I will not have them disobey that which I have commanded. And so he scatters them. Confuses their language. They can't understand each other. And he scatters them across the face of the earth. So what's the point? Why do we have this passage in Scripture? What's the main point here? Let me assure you that the main point is most likely not don't build towers. Uh, I mean, that you might think that that's the, the main point, but I don't really think that's what it is. I think it's not about the physical building. It's about the attitude behind it. Don't build a tower thinking that God's going to come down and do exactly what you want him to do. Don't build a life thinking that God's going to come down and do exactly what you want him to do. But rather, our lives should be built so that when God comes down, we're ready to do what he wants us to do. You cannot build a life that is built around the idea that if I do enough stuff, if I build a fancy enough tower, if I build a nice enough city, if I become wealthy enough, if enough people will come to my city and do things my way, then God, when he comes down, won't look at me with judgment. He won't look at me with rebuke. He will look and say, wow, great job. You've done some awesome stuff. Rather, we build a life that says, Lord God, would you come down in your grace and in your mercy as you did that day in Bethlehem, as you stayed through that life, as you stayed, as you brought your mercy down at Calvary. That's the visitation that we want from the Lord. Not a visitation of, of domestication, but a visitation of his grace. Not a visitation of, his contro of controlling him that we might benefit and that we might profit and that we might make a name for ourselves, but rather that we would let his name be known. That his name, 
his reputation, his glory would be that which we carry as we are scattered throughout the whole earth. Let us not build ourselves a city and a tower that says, this way I will not be moved, this is where I came, this is where I will be. But rather, let us build a life that walks with Jesus throughout. See, it's an interesting development across 11 chapters of Genesis. Really, across just eight. When they're in the garden, Adam and Eve walk with God. And then by the time you get here to Genesis chapter 11, they're not even seeking to walk with God anymore. They're seeking to say, this is where I am, and I expect God to come to me. I expect God to do that which I demand of Him. Folks, that's not who God is. He is the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the God of the whole earth. When he comes, he comes to do his work, not to meet our demands. He comes for salvation and healing. He comes with glory and with righteousness. He comes that we would worship him. Not that we would build a city that we charge admission to, that people would only be able to come into worship if they pay us what we desire, but rather that we would all realize that that price was paid when he died for us. That we would, have, that we would recognize that it does not take a common language and a common location that we would worship God, but that we can come with all of our different ways and our different cultures and our different expressions and still come and to worship God. After all, when we look in Revelation, we see this amazing picture in eternity gathered around the throne, people of every tribe and every tongue and every race and every language to worship together. Which is the glory of the cross. It is the power of the blood of Jesus that it is no longer about what blood runs in your veins or my veins, but what blood flows from the cross that we would be saved. From Genesis 11 on through the rest of the text until you hit Revelation, most of, much of Scripture reflects that people are looking for home because we're scattered. And it's important that we realize that we should always feel scattered. Because home is not a place, it's not the plains of Shinar, it's not the, the mountains of Ararat, it's not even the nice flat tree-lined roads of Ashley County. Home is instead in the presence of the Lord God Almighty and home is gathered with the people of God. Our home is not based off of a geography, but it's based instead off of being with the people that God has placed us with. So what do we do about this? Well, we don't build towers. We don't build big ones. We don't build them figuratively and say, this, this piece of dirt, and if I, as long as I've got this piece of dirt, I'm good. But rather we look and say, as long as I've got God's people, I'm good. 
We don't build barriers and set up admission, admission checkpoints for people to come and to worship. And we certainly don't seek to make a name for ourselves in the process, but instead we always push people back to the name above all names. The name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We worry sometimes in our day about this distraction, that distraction, is that the Antichrist, is this this, is this that, and yet when you go to 1 John we see that it is that name, it is that confession that Jesus is Lord is what we're seeking. Those of us who are gathered together in this place and in this time, that's our calling. That's the tower that we should seek to build is the tower of those who are gathered to confess. Rather than one made of baked brick, with tar, or with rocks and mortar, all these things in due time will fade away. One of my uh, hobby follows on social media is actually a group called the Abandoned Arkansas Foundation. They go through and take pictures of places that are just used to be fan used to be big and nice and are now faltering and falling apart. They've published a few books. One of them is actually entitled Abandoned South Arkansas. Has pictures from things in Cross It that just no longer in use. Some stuff out farther out to the east of us between here and the river. One of the other things that they've dog documented is things like Dog Patch USA. Some of y'all remember Dog Patch. Things that were built and in their time were fancy and important and special and now not so much. If we're going to build, let us build on a foundation of the living stone. Let us build with lives that which does not decay but is instead eternal. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for bringing us here. We thank you for giving us each other. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us to seek you fully. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.